Here's a fun fact for you. Did you know that the very first female infantry officer in the United States Army hails from right here in Connecticut? It's true. In 2016, just a few months after then Secretary of Defense Ash Carter announced that the military would open up combat arms jobs to women, Captain Kristen Greist rebranched from the military police to the infantry, the first woman to do so. But this wasn't the first time that the Orange Native made military history. In 2015, she and First Lieutenant Shea Haver became the first two women to graduate from the Army's prestigious Ranger School. Needless to say, Captain Greist is a fierce competitor and a trailblazer. But she isn't the only woman with Connecticut ties who made a lasting impact on the military. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into history and count down seven remarkable women who helped shape the United States and its military throughout the years. Number 6. Margaret Burke White Photos and video are some of the most important historical artifacts we have from the modern era. From the very earliest cameras to today's DSLRs, mirrorless, and camera phones, combat correspondents have helped document some of the most important moments of the 20th century and beyond. One of those daring photogs was Margaret Burke White. Born in the Bronx and living her later part of life in Stamford, Margaret was a woman of many firsts. Some of her trailblazing achievements include the first female war correspondent, the first woman allowed to work in a combat zone during World War II, the first foreign photographer allowed to capture images of the Soviet industry during its five-year plan, and the first female photographer for Life magazine. That's quite the impressive career if you ask me. Number 5. Rosie the Riveter when someone says Rosie the Riveter, the image of J. Howard Miller's short-lived work incentive poster for the Westinghouse Electric and Manufacturing Company is probably what comes to mind. You know the one. It's the iconic image of an overall clad woman with a red bandana in her hair declaring, we can do it. But did you know the character of Rosie the Riveter was based on a real person? In fact, there were several women who served as models for the role, two of which including the original Rosie, have ties to Connecticut. Rosalind Palmer, who grew up in Fairfield, took a job at the age of 19 to help build fighter planes at a factory in Stratford. While working there, she caught the attention of New York journalist Igor Cassini, who wrote about Miss Palmer in his Charlie Knickerbocker column. This article went on to inspire songwriters Red Evans and John Jacob Loeb to write the song Rosie the Riveter, which was popularized by several bands in 1943. Another woman to don the iconic moniker was Mary Doyle Keefe. Before moving to Connecticut, Miss Keefe worked as a telephone operator in Vermont. She had no experience with riveting or working in a factory, but was asked by a neighbor if she'd be willing to model for a painting anyway. Who was that neighbor, you ask? It was no other than famed artist Norman Rockwell. The final painting featured an overall clad Keefe with a rivet gun slung across her lap and her foot stomped down against a copy of Adolf Hitler's manifesto, Mein Kampf. The painting would make its way onto the cover of the Saturday Evening Post and later decorate advertisements for government bonds. Number 4. Sybil Ludington one if by land and two if by sea, and I on the opposite shore will be, ready to ride and spread the alarm through every Middlesex village and farm, for the country folk to be up and to arm. We've all heard the story of Paul Revere's ride on the night of April 18, 1775. He and William Dawes rode to meet John Hancock and Samuel Adams in Lexington, waking some 40 other riders along the way. But did you know that two years later, another midnight rider took to the saddle and made another important ride to rally the troops against an advancing British army? That rider was 16-year-old Sybil Ludington. On April 21, 1777, the British attacked Danbury because of its status as a supply depot for the Continental Army. Ludington's father was a colonel of a regiment in eastern New York, just west of Danbury. On the night of April 26, the Ludingtons received a rider who brought word of the attack. Unfortunately, the colonel's regiment had been disbanded so his troops could attend to their farms during planting season and were spread out across miles. With the rider unable to continue on, young Sybil took up the reins and rode through the night, and torrential rain, to rally her father's men declaring the British are burning Danbury, muster at Ludingtons. 
By the time she returned home, several hundred men had mustered, ready to march against the enemy forces. Number three, the women of the defense councils. War is expensive, and I'm not just talking financially. There's a cost which is paid by families, friends, neighbors, and employers. During World War II, the government relied heavily on citizens to help ease these non-financial burdens. Here in Connecticut and all across the nation, women volunteered to carry out a number of tasks to help their neighborhoods and the soldiers overseas. Some of these tasks included selling war bonds, providing first aid services, educating the public about health and nutrition, broadcasting the news via sound trucks, and offering a bond wagon for residents who couldn't get to the bank. Although these women may not have been overseas or officially with the military, their contributions were important nevertheless and deserving to be on this list. Number two, the women of WAC. On May 15, 1942, the Women's Army Corps was created as an auxiliary unit to the U.S. Army. The WAC provided women the opportunity to enlist in the Army and have hands-on contributions to the war effort. The first women who enlisted into the WAC had three career choices, switchboard operations, mechanical, or baking. However, later in the war, as the value of women's contributions were more widely recognized, the number of opportunities expanded to include jobs such as postal clerks, stenographers, nurses, and armorers. By the end of the war, approximately 150,000 women enlisted into the WAC. Of those, 3,300 came from Connecticut. Without a doubt, these women played a pivotal role in the military's success providing manpower and a variety of support roles for the troops on the front line. The WAC was disbanded as a branch in 1978 when the Army integrated women into traditional units. Number 1. Agent 355 Okay, so we may have cheated a little on this one, since the true identity of Agent 355 has never been revealed. Also, it's more than likely that if she was a real person, she was from New York and not Connecticut. But her ties to the nutmeg state are worthy enough to make it on this list since, if the stories are true, her actions may have played an important role in turning the tide of the Revolutionary War in favor of the American forces. As the story goes, Agent 355 was a spy in George Washington's Culper Ring. This mysterious group operated out of New York, Long Island, and Connecticut between 1779 and 1783 to divulge British secrets to General Washington. Some of the intelligence the Culper Ring uncovered includes information on a surprise attack against Lieutenant General Rochambeau's troops in Newport, Rhode Island, a plan to counterfeit American currency, and the details of British Major General William Tryon's raid against New Haven, Fairfield, and Norwalk. But Agent 355's most notorious work comes from providing evidence of famed Connecticut turncoat Benedict Arnold's plot to surrender West Point to the British, an action that saved a key strategic location for the Continental Army. We hope you enjoyed this countdown of seven Connecticut women who made a difference in American military history. This was by no means an exhaustive list, so if you know anyone who should be included in this list, drop their names down in the comments.